Hello everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Gaming in the Wild, a video games podcast about games from the artistic, creative side of the tracks, from indie to AAA. My name's John, I'm your host, and tonight in Reykjavik it's a dark, snowy Sunday night, there is snow swirling outside the windows. It's been, it's been like this all week actually, it's been pretty cold, it's been pretty snowy, pretty stormy, lots of time for games, and I have been playing a fair bit I picked up my Switch for the first time in a while this week. Um, I'm always kind of tinkering with it, but it's been a while since my, my main game was a Switch game. But there is a big Switch sale on at the moment, and I always have my, my wish list going, and I'll check it every few weeks. And it turned out that this week, something I've been wanting to play for quite a while, it's an old game, it's a 2014 game. It's Guacamole, the um, Metroidvania, Mexican-themed Metroidvania that came out in 2014 originally. And I've never played this one, but I, I hear it mentioned from time to time. Um, and people that seem to have good taste in games bring up Guacamole sometimes. And I've always been curious about it, and it was on sale for just $3.00. So I picked that one up and I've been playing it every day, playing like half an hour a day, maybe just before bed or something, and I'm almost at the end of that game. And so the featured game of this episode will be Guacamole. Um, but funnily enough, at the same time as I've been playing that one, I have been playing the latest game by the same studio, uh, Nobody Saves the World. This was a game that came suddenly to Xbox in December, on Game Pass. Um, I wasn't waiting for it. Um, it seemed to just come out of nowhere. People were very happy about it. People played it. People got into it very quickly. And I did too, actually. I picked it up um, just to see what it was like, as I do with everything that comes onto Game Pass. Pretty much, I will at least give a quick go to see if I like it or not. And Nobody Saves the World was one of those games where you pick it up for just a moment and then realize you've been playing it for an hour or two or three. It's a very addictive game. Um, and it's been very interesting to play Guacamole at the same time as playing Nobody Saves the World, because you can see a through line from Drinkbox Studios. You can see this playful sense of humor that they have. You can see that they're very light on story. The story is kind of comedically basic. Um, in Nobody Saves the World, you play... A strange little guy who can uh, change forms between a knight and a ranger and a wizard and an egg and a horse. Um, and as you play through this game, doing side quests for people, trying to reunite a broken crystal, as you do in so many video games. Why is it always a broken crystal, guys? Really? But um, as you're working your way through this, this kind of obligatory sort of plot... Um, you meet a lot of people and you unlock a lot of forms. And there is a sort of story that you're a mysterious shapeshifter um, and you don't quite know who you are as you're playing this game. You are nobody and the game is called Nobody Saves the World, Nobody Is You. And so that's the, that's the story draw of that one really, is that you're, you're going to find out exactly what nobody is as you progress through this game. And because nobody isn't really a somebody... Uh, nobody can flip between all kinds of, of shapes. They all have different abilities. You can mix and match different abilities. For example, the horse has a kick. Um, the slug can do poison slime. Um, the, the knight has a sword, obviously. And you can take that sword ability and add it into one of the slots of the slug. And so you can be a slug that has bow and arrow and sword attack. And all of the attacks have different um, powers, like there are light attacks, sharp attacks, blunt attacks, poison attacks. And you have to mix and match so that your build on any particular given character has a variety of different attacks because some will work on one enemy and some will not. Um, so it's quite a complex, kind of fun, fast-paced, fast uh, crowd control -y kind of dungeon crawler with this um, Zelda-looking world, and I've, I've been continuing to play it, and I have been enjoying it. I have talked about this one before, but as I'm progressing through it, I'm really having a lot of fun with it. It's very simple. It's very easy to play. Um, it's enjoyable all the time, and, and I think that's, a, that's a, a trademark of Drinkbox games. It's something that I've also been finding with Guacamole, is that it's a very easy game to play, um, the difficulty, sure, I mean, the, I'm not talking about difficulty when I say that. I'm more talking about 
the gameplay and the game design. It's frictionless. It's frictionless gameplay. Um, the stories are very really easy to get along with. They are colourful to look at and they sound good. So it's been really fun to play a 2014 Drinkbox game that's eight years old now and a brand new one and to just get a feel for this studio and what they're doing. Um, and I think I'm going to continue playing Nobody Saves the World. There's, there's enough going on in it to make me curious enough to continue. Um, I think I have gotten about halfway through the map. Um, I seem to be going pretty slowly on how long to beat. It says that Nobody Saves the World is a 14-hour game. I'm not yet a full halfway through exploring this map, and I'm already on 11 hours. Um, I think it said that a, a completionist playthrough is 25 hours. Um, and I guess I have been skipping dungeons. The dungeons are really fun, but what's more fun is just running around in the world. So I've been running around in the world an awful lot, and perhaps progressing the story quite slowly. So I might lean towards a completionist uh, length playthrough of that one, which I guess speaks to just how much fun it is. It's a really enjoyable game. If you have Game Pass and you have any fondness for Zelda likes, twin stick shooters, dungeon crawlers, um, crowd control type of games. If you enjoyed, for example, the combat in Death's Door, where you're locked into a room and you have to fend off waves, if you like wave-based combat, um, this is a really fun one. It's it's really polished, it's really arcadey, really enjoyable. Uh, that's Nobody Saves the World. Um, I've also been continuing to play Halo Infinite. I'm working my way through it slowly. For some reason, I've, I've tailed off a little bit. I had... This is a strangely... Xboxy thing that happens to me. It happened on Forza Horizon 5. I was completely addicted to it for a couple of weeks. And then I just hit a wall where I felt like I'd seen it and done it and never played it again. And I'm having that thing with Halo Infinite now. I had a couple of weeks where I was very much into clearing the map, uh, progressing around and kind of finding different enemy camps and working my way through this open world um, shooter. Uh, the story isn't really that involving, so I'm not that bothered about the story. And just like in Forza, I hit a really um, considerable wall and just felt done with it in a really surprising way. For a game that you are enjoying so much, um, hitting a wall where you just feel done with it, it's it's a weird feeling because you, you want to see it through. You want to get to the end of the story and squeeze all of the drops of enjoyment out of a game before you move on. But when it starts to feel like work to, to continue playing it, it's a very specific feeling. I don't know if you if you know what I'm uh, talking about, listener, but to be enjoying a game that much and then to just suddenly stop um, without having completed it. You have a, a sense that you want to push it forward. And it's strange that it's two Xbox games. It is Forza and Halo that have fiercely addicted me. And then it's just sort of dried up, if you know what I mean. But there we go. I'm going to continue playing Halo probably quite slowly. I think if I pick it up, play 20 minutes, and just um, having cleaned off the map pretty much, I think I really only have story left to go. I have a fully upgraded Master Chief. Um, and so maybe I'll just pick it up every now and then, do one story mission, put it down again, and hopefully see credits before the end of the year. Um, what else happened this week? There was a Nintendo Direct, a surprise as always. They just they just drop them. Um, and there was, I don't know, it was a pretty light one for me. There wasn't an awful lot that I'm interested in. Um, as is often the case with these Nintendo Directs, um, if it's going to be something Pokemon-y or if it's going to be something Animal Crossing-y, then I don't really care that much. And this time it's Kirby. Kirby is a thing. And the Mario sports games I don't really care about. And... That was one of the big announcements. So those games will just pass me by. I like Metroid. I like mainline Mario games. I like Zelda. That's my real flavor of Nintendo. There was nothing really for me from Nintendo. But there was a couple of announcements of some ports. And um, I mean, in past Nintendo Indie World Directs, a game like Fez has been very exciting to me. Uh, which is very funny because it's a pretty old game. And this time, um, it was old games again. No Man's Sky is coming to Switch, which is something that I have joked about in the past um, because I just didn't see how it could be possible to bring No Man's Sky to Switch, given that it has this infinite procedural 
open universe where you're flitting in and out of the atmospheres of planets. Planets are being generated as you land on them for the first time. They're being automatically generated with their own fauna and their own flora, their own topography, um, the color scheme. Everything that you're seeing is just being uh, invented by the game. So there is a sense of discovering things that no one has seen before within that procedural framework. Um, and so it's going to be very interesting to see how they've managed to bring that to Switch because it is a technically challenging game. I would say even on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One generation, those consoles struggled with it a little bit. Um, now that it's on PS5, it runs better, but trying to squeeze that down onto a Switch, it's just uh, such an unlikely port um, I'm really wondering if it's going to run at a very low resolution. I'm very curious about the technical performance, but that was interesting nonetheless. And the other thing that caught my eye was the Portal Companion Collection, Portal 1 and Portal 2, two great games. Um, they were available as part of the Orange Box, and so they've been on, available on console before, but not on Switch. And I think this is going to be a great opportunity to play through those games again on Switch and to just enjoy them in a handheld format. It is something that I would probably buy, even though I own those games on Steam and I've played them on my MacBook. I think Switch might be a really nice place for them. They're at that, that age where the graphics still look pretty good, you know? Um, but they are old games and therefore they're perfect for the Switch. It's an old game that has aged well, that will run well on that chip, on that, uh, that handheld tiny little wonder machine. So I think I will play Portal again on the Switch when that comes out. Um, the Kirby game that uh, was the big news of the thing, um, I'm not sure about that. I've never really been a Kirby guy, um, but it does look interesting. I think I'll, I'll wait for the reviews, and if it really is something that people go crazy about, then I might go for it, but other than that, I'll probably skip it. But anyway, there was a Nintendo Direct, No Man's Sky and Portal, um, pretty interesting. I think Fire Emblem fans are getting a new Muzo game, like the uh, the Hyrule Warriors. They're getting a, a Fire Emblem Warriors, although no one seems particularly um, excited about that. I get the feeling that these things are mostly for a Japanese market that enjoys these kind of crossover games. For me personally, not a big Fire Emblem fan, not a big Muzo fan, so that's another one to skip. But there we go. There, there'll be a few more Nintendo Directs this year. So hopefully we'll get some news about Zelda and Prime 4 and the Prime Trilogy uh, collection and ports of Wind Waker and all of those exciting Nintendo things that we're all yearning for. But before I get on to talking about Guacamole, let me quickly mention that this is a patron-supported show. So if you enjoy this episode today, um, if you're a first-time listener or a long-time listener, you can go to patreon.com slash gaminginthewild and sign up for a dollar a month to get occasional extra episodes, to get a Discord invite, and to support me and this podcast. I very much appreciate it. Um, it's a nice little community that we have around the podcast. You're welcome to join it on our Discord. It's patreon.com slash gaming in the wild. And with that out of the way, let's move on and talk about Guacamole. Not just Guacamole, but the Super Turbo Championship Edition. So Guacamole is a game that came out back in 2014. It was on PC, it was on PlayStation and Xbox. It came out in October of 2018 on Switch. There is also a sequel. Both were on sale when I picked up Guacamole. It was £3 for the original, £5 for the sequel, and I picked them up both of them. It's £8 for both games. Feels like a big bargain. Um, and this game was critically acclaimed at the time. It has an 86 on Metacritic. How Long To Beat has it at 6 hours to complete the game, 14 hours for completionists. And the studio Drinkbox describes it as uh, Guacamole Super Turbo Championship Edition is a Metroidvania-style action platformer set in a magical world inspired by traditional Mexican culture and folklore. Join Juan de Agave Farmer, who stumbles upon a legendary luchador mask 
and finds the strength and courage to become the hero he's always dreamed of being. And I say I've got a pretty short and sweet description of this one. I say it's a bright, crisp, Mexico-inspired Metroidvania that looks fresh, plays well, and doesn't outstay its welcome. And this is a pretty a simple game in many ways, and I think that that's kind of what Drinkbox does. It's kind of what they're aiming for, it's what they do well. It is Metroidvania style. It's um, side-on, 2D, side-scroller, um, in a Metroidvania sort of semi-open world, there are different biomes. There is a desert, a mountaintop, a swamp, a graveyard, a village or two, uh, caves, etc. Um, and it's all set in Mexico. It's a beautiful art style. It's very designy. Everything has these cool, bold shapes and bright colors. Um, it looks just great. Like as you're running through the village, you will see billboards with graphic design on them. You'll see logos on the outside of bars and restaurants. Um, the costume design is cool. The, the luchador character that you play has broad shoulders and a tiny waist. It has this kind of Mexico superhero feel to it that's really fresh and really interesting, really inspired feeling. It's very different from what we're used to seeing. Um, and while it is a Metroidvania, I would say the action platformer is probably closer to the truth. It's loosely Metroidvania in that you will get abilities that allow you to explore previously unattainable areas or unreachable areas. But mostly you will, it's pretty linear, I would say, for a Metroidvania. If the, the least linear Metroidvania is something like Hollow Knight, which is just an a huge world with so many secrets, so many different ways in which the biomes are interconnected. Um, and everyone that you talk to will have a slightly different journey through that game. Everyone that I've spoken to took it in different orders. It's very open. It's very free. This one's pretty different. It's a much smaller scale proposition and it is quite linear. Like you do have to go from story point to story point you get map markers of where they are. And while you can return to older areas to use your abilities to find secrets, you're pretty much just uh, shoved around the map in a really enjoyable way. Um, there is platforming, there is combat, which is really fun. There are those locked in arena style combat rooms. If anyone's played Death Store recently, they'll know about what I mean by that. There are times when the walls come down, the doors are locked, and you have to fight off a few waves of bad guys to continue. Then there are some quite kind of hardcore platforming sections where you have to use lots of different abilities um, in quick succession and be very nimble and quick to, to get through these kind of brutal, um, kind of fun, challenging platform sections. Then you have boss battles. You have a couple of little hubs, like a little town that you can go to and talk to people. Um, and that's where the story begins. The story begins when you, Juan, an agave farmer, um, has your love interest kidnapped, and she's the mayor's daughter, and she's whisked off by a demon. This is a skull-faced demon who has come from the world of the dead, a uh, very smartly dressed guy with a big brimmed hat, like a, a cowboy film villain, and he whisks off the mayor's daughter, um, and he casts you off to the world of the dead, but rather than passing on, Juan finds a powerful magic luchador mask, like a Mexican wrestler mask, and he becomes um, a hero, the hero that he's always wanted to be. And and that's the story. It's pretty basic stuff. You have to run through this world. You have to fight bad guys, find new abilities, uh, explore this, this interesting world. It's a, a good, solid video game with some good... Uh, well-conceived gameplay, a really solid look and feel. And while it's not an incredibly deep experience, I've, I've found it to be a really, really enjoyable one. I've enjoyed my time with Guacamole so far. And while this is a game that's light on story, um, that does mean that it is mostly focused on gameplay. Um, it's light on story, it looks fresh and sounds good, but the gameplay is really what this is all about. 
and it is a metroidvania that means that as you progress through the story that you start from with quite a basic move set but you find statues that are they're basically the metroid statues there's chozo statues if you've played super metroid you'll know what i mean you see them side on and they're sitting and they're holding an orb and every time you find one of those you get a new power and there is quite a lot of them and you get a lot of powers in pretty quick succession which i think is a really um, a good boon for guacamole. I mean, it knows that it needs to keep feeding you new things to do to, to keep the energy up and to keep the pace up. And this is a game that is very well paced and does have a lot of energy. So they've really succeeded in that. Um, it is a brawler as well, which is kind of interesting. You know, Super Metroid obviously um, isn't a, a melee game. So this is a, a melee style Metroid game. Um, you have a simple three hit combo you get an uppercut which throws enemies into the air. You can then juggle them in the air for a really long time. So it becomes a fun task figuring out how to juggle enemies for the longest time. The longer that you can stay off the ground, the better. It means other enemies can't get you. Um, and it means that your opponent is disabled for that entire time. You will also get a floor smash. You'll get a headbutt. Um, and when you've hit an enemy a few times in a row, they, they get a little... Um, tool tip that tells you that it's time to do a wrestling move on them and so you can grab an enemy and then you get a little arrow that you can turn around decide which direction you want to throw them in and you can toss them across the combat arena which will knock over other enemies or you if you're in the air you can drive them into the ground for for really heavy damage and the combat is really fun it's quite um, involved with all of those different moves that you get. You can feel, you do feel quite mobile in, in the combat. You feel like you have quite a lot of freedom that you can come up with strategies and combos that you enjoy and keep, feel comfortable playing with. And you can really build on that and get your own style going. So it's quite a successful brawler. Um, more so than I would have expected, actually. I think that the the different abilities that you get, they do add a lot to the game. It's a good, solid move set. Um, and, of course, because it's a Metroidvania, you also get uh, exploration-based abilities. You get a double jump. You can run up walls. You can hang on walls and jump between them. Um, all the things that we've become used to from Hollow Knight and in Ori, the Ori games, you'll find it all in Guacamole. It's all here. It's all present and correct. So you'll be doing lots of challenging platforming. You'll be using those abilities to um, explore the world and to get where you need to go. And on your way to get the mayor's daughter, you'll run into the lieutenants of this uh, dark presence that's stolen her away. And they're pretty funny, actually. They are strange, like a uh, what would you say, like reworkings of Mexican mythology. But the tone of the game is very light. It's very playful. It's comedic. They're all kind of um, caricatures and they're all kind of incompetent. Uh, the boss fights are challenging, I would say, but not too much. When I, when I got Guacamole, one of the things I was worried about was that people said it's a very challenging game that needs really good response times. Um, I haven't really struggled with it. I think um, one boss I had to take four or five runs at. But other than that, I pretty much um, rocketed through this game. I think because the gameplay is so solid and you do feel like you are very much in control of your character, it never feels unfair when you die in this game. It never feels cheap. Um, it always feels like you could have done better if you are killed. It does feel like you probably messed up. Maybe you didn't position yourself well. Maybe you didn't take care of crowd control by prioritizing the most troublesome enemies first. Um, so there's always a, a way that you can improve what you've done in this game. Um, and I never felt like it was unfair. Um, one of the other good innovations in this one is there is a dark world and a light world. You can flick between them at the touch of a button, the world, the world of the living and the dead. It's another um, power-up that you will get. And the scenery changes when you do so. So a corridor might be blocked by a wall. If you flip into the world of the dead, that wall disappears. Um, and that's kind of fun. It's, it's nice to be able to just flick between two worlds in a game. It gives it an extra sense of... 
uh, mystery that I really enjoy. Um, they build that into some really challenging platform puzzles. So you might be hanging on to a moving platform coming towards a wall and you have to jump, flick between the, the light world and the dark world uh, mid jump and then flick back to catch onto the next wall. So it gets into some very nimble platforming territory. Um, and they, they do make good use of all of the platform uh, platforming skills and exploration skills that you get. Um, you will have to uppercut through red ceiling tiles to get to new areas. And then you can floor smash through green ones. You can do like a, a thrust punch through blue walls. Um, and enemies throughout the game will get shields on them. So if you see a blue shielded enemy, you know that you have to use that thrust punch. If you see a red shielded enemy, you have to break that shield using the uppercut. Um, and towards the end of the game, the arena combat and the platforming gets really complicated with you having to string together lots of different special moves to juggle different enemies, to break the shields of different enemies in these arena battles, and to progress through increasingly complicated platforming areas. And I find it really satisfying to do so. This is, this is a good time, this game. And I was really intrigued by the art style of this one. I did actually look into it a little bit. It turns out that Drinkbox is a Canadian studio, but this game was inspired by the work of a young artist called Augusto uh, Quijano, I believe, is how it would be pronounced. And he is a, a Yucatecan artist. He works at Drinkbox. He was really into um, his homeland of Mexico, the bright culture, the bright colors, and the, the wonderful folklore that he, he had grown up with wasn't something that he was seeing in, in mass culture. You know, he was used to, he'd grown up with the uh, the bad guys living in the desert that were drunken, the cowboy movie villains. And he was very interested in, in bringing to the table a different look at Mexico that's more joyful, colorful, where these luchadors are, they're nobles. They are like wrestler superheroes and they are the defenders of the people. Um, so he's, it is a simple caricature of Mexican culture in a way that might make you raise an eyebrow, but it's very well intended, I think. It is joyful, it is generous, it does have a festive feeling to it, and everyone in the game is Mexican. Um, it, it's, it's a pure Mexico-inspired game in a really unusual way. It's not a setting that we see a lot of, um, and I thought they did a really great job with it. As for the downsides of this game, there really aren't many. It's a very well put together game. I am by no means like a, a, a technically competent pro level Twitch reflex gamer uh, by any means whatsoever, but I found the difficulty well pitched in this one. There is a, um, a, a challenging um, aspect to the combat and platforming, but as I said earlier, it never felt cheap. It always felt earned. Um, it always felt surmountable um, and it's pretty episodic. So it can feel quite light, like the feeling that you get sometimes in a good Metroidvania when the map opens up is that it's really just going to go on forever and there is so much to see. Um, Guacamole is not that. It's a compressed world. It's pretty small. And the, the Metroidvania aspect of backtracking, looping and opening up old areas, it's very minimal. Um, it wouldn't have made a huge difference if this game was just linear. So the Metroidvania looping aspect is not the strength of the game, really. Most of them are challenge levels, like you'll find a temple, or you'll find a giant tree, or you'll find a cave system. You'll go through it once, and each one contains platforming challenges and combat challenges. You come out the other side and go back to a hub area, like the village, or areas that, that you've seen before in the game. But the, other than that, you won't be going back to those areas 
unless you are doing like a completionist run and you want to go and use new abilities to open secret rooms than you couldn't before. Um, I personally don't feel like I will um, go through all the dungeons a second time once I've got all the powers. It was fun enough the first time. It's just a, a light, enjoyable experience. And I was playing it before bed partially because you can play five or ten minutes and feel like you got some stuff done in this game. Um, it is short, it is snappy, um, but if you are into the Hollow Knights and the Ories of this world and you're expecting something like that, just be warned that this is a much lighter experience, um, so it doesn't have that, that depth, it doesn't have that uh, scale. It's a very lightweight, fresh, brisk kind of game, um, and I think that it's all the better for it, actually. This is a game that I had a really good fun time with, that's, that's Guacamelee. So I hope you enjoyed that review of Guacamole. Um, I actually did forget something else that happened this week in games. I, I picked up a headset. I haven't owned a gaming headset before. It wasn't really a thing last time around, but there have been a couple times lately where someone wanted to play Forza or someone wanted to play uh, It Takes Two. I am planning to play It Takes Two with Kieran Daly, who is a sometime guest on the show. So it was really fun to get that headset. I am now all set up for multiplayer on the Xbox. Um, so I might dip a toe in the water. I'll start with It Takes Two. I'm not sure I'm gonna be uh, going into the, the heavy, the deep end of uh, multiplayer shooters or battle royals or anything like that. It's really not my vibe, but it will be really nice to be able to play It Takes Two with Kieran at least. And good to have the option. It's a nice headset actually. It's got good bass, it's very comfortable. So it is the official Xbox headset. So I'm really happy to have that. Maybe me and Kieran will finally get time to play It Takes Two, which we've been planning to do for quite a while since before the Game Awards. Um, Kieran wanted to play it last year. Um, and I'm keen to give it a try too, given all of the, the critical hype that it got. Not sure if we'll get that done in the next week, but who knows, maybe we will. So yeah, hope you enjoyed the episode. If you've played Guacamole, if you've enjoyed Metroidvanias, if you've played Nobody Saves the World, any of the other games that I've talked about today, feel free to come and say hi. I'm on social media as Gaming in the Wild. Twitter is the main place, but I'm everywhere else as well. Um, you are also welcome to support the show via Patreon if you would like to. Always fun to have a new member in that Discord community. It's a really fun place to chat. Come and share your Wordle score, talk about the Direct, talk about what you bought on sale. It's a really nice little community, so it's patreon.com slash gaminginthewild if you're interested in that. Other than that, thanks very much for listening. I'll be back next week with a new episode. Take care of yourselves and each other. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>